guys. We have some questions. We have some breaking news. Hopefully, we're going to have some answers from part of Ammon Bundy's legal defense team. Uh, this is regarding the Nevada Bunkerville trial. Tier one is uh, kind of what we're going to start off talking about. And so, uh, with us tonight, we've got Ammon Bundy's um, attorney, uh, Morgan Philpott. And um, then we've got some supporters and some some helpers also, and that's uh, Rick Herber and John Lamb, and I am Kelly Stewart. I know there was some questions the other night on the broadcast that we did uh, about who is Rick Herber and what is his role in this. And so just to let you guys know, he's here just uh, being a voice. Um, he is a he's a he's a he's a brilliant man, and uh, we're. we're very blessed to have him amongst us. He helped in the not guilty verdict that Ammon Bundy saw um, October 27th um, when he joined that team. And while he will not actually be on the team in Nevada, he will still be working tirelessly behind the scenes to help um, guarantee another, God willing, another not guilty verdict uh, in the Nevada uh, charges, in the Nevada trial. So we're happy to have him with us. We're happy to have Ammon's attorney with us and John Lamb. And uh, while people start to come on, I guess I don't have my computer up, so I do not know where we're at as far as an audience yet. Can you guys let me know, Rick? It looks like we got about 11 people so far. Oh, well, we'll talk for just a quick second and let people come on. And you got... uh, so something I am going to discuss quickly before we get started, um, there was some breaking news. Uh, we learned that there was potentially a actually a not guilty verdict on count one and two for the Nevada team that we did not hear about. We were told that it was a hung jury. Uh, we were told that the only charges that they were decisive about were the eight counts uh, against Greg Burleson that were guilty, as well as the two counts against Todd Burleson that were guilty and everything else was a hung jury. Where now um, some things are unraveling. Deb Jordan thankfully shared uh, some some things off of PACER tonight, uh, which is court records, and um, we're going to hopefully get some more information because from what we're seeing, it looks like uh, there's more to the story than what uh, we were told by Judge Navarro as far as the verdicts go. Real quick, I'm just going to take this opportunity to take about three minutes and uh, and uh, talk quickly about something that I think is really important, and uh, I want to talk about Juror 4 and Juror 11 from the uh, Oregon stand-up uh, trial back in October. Uh, we talk often about Juror 4 and about how Juror 4 uh, called out Juror 11. Juror 11 was the biased judge, uh, juror who was going to cause it to be a hung jury. And um, thankfully, uh, the Lord prompted Juror 4 to stand on his integrity and call out Juror 11 as a uh, bias. But what a lot of people don't know is what I'm about to say, uh, how Juror 11 actually got removed. Um, when we talk about this, we often say, thank God for Juror 4. Without Juror 4, um, there would have been a hung jury. And I want to correct that because it's actually not true. Juror 4 called out Juror 11, and um, Judge Anna Brown called in Juror 11 and had a very, very short meeting with him and asked him, have you become biased since I met you in Vordir? And he said, no. And he was actually permitted to go back to the jury room. The reason juror um, 11 ended up being removed was not simply alone juror four calling him out, but it was the combination of the team that we're looking at right now. Sorry, my phone might die on me. Um, the, the combination here of Rick Kerber assisting behind the scenes um, and Morgan Philpott willing to file the motion for mistrial if they did not remove Juror 11. And that didn't come easily. Um, there, uh, some of the other attorneys didn't want to move forward with removing Juror 11. We all had speculations on, was Juror 11 for us or against us? If we file this motion and they remove this man and he was the only one who was saying not guilty, we've just brought on a unanimous guilty verdict. But the Lord put it on these men's hearts to stand their ground and to say they don't care what his verdict was. He said he was biased and they wanted him removed from uh, from the, the jury uh, trial. And he was removed. And we know, I think it was either three or five hours 
I think it was three hours after the new juror was brought on, we had a unanimous not guilty verdict and a great victory in Oregon. So for those of you who've been asking the question, who is Rick Herber? I want you guys to understand that he was much of the brains behind the scenes in Oregon. And we, I personally have a ton of gratitude to him for coming on and being willing to um, just sacrifice his own resources and time to secure that not guilty verdict with the rest of the team. So with that, I'm going to go ahead and turn it over and say, um, Rick, let's talk about this jury form. Let's talk about the check marks and uh, the not guilty verdict that it looks like has been hidden from the people. All right. Hold on just a second, Kelly. I looks like we might have lost Morgan here. Let's just check real quick. Morgan, doing a quick check. Are you there? Yeah, I'm here with you. Did you oh, there you go. All right. Very good. And then let's just make sure we got John as well. John, you there? I'm here. Yes, I am. All right. Very good. And then let's just check. We've only got, uh, well, there's somebody's got a cell phone or something laying next to their, or on a, on a board or something. And when the messages come in, it's really sending a lot of message or sending a lot of vibration to everybody. So, uh, let's see if we can hmm. fix that. All right, Kelly, I see, I see 96 people, uh, on. Okay. So let's just correct one other thing real quick. Um, the, uh, I appreciate the description of my involvement. I work as Morgan Philpott's paralegal uh, and law clerk. So when Morgan, I was I was helping uh, Mike Arnold up in um, Oregon as a volunteer, and then when there needed to be that change of counsel, and Morgan came on, I came onto that case as his paralegal. Obviously, I have a relationship with Marcus Mumford. You mentioned my role down in Nevada. I just, in the interest of candor, uh, I still am working as Morgan's paralegal. So when Morgan got admitted on that case down there, he kind of has to bring me along with him, whether he likes it or not. That's not really true. He could fire me, but uh, so far he hasn't done that. So I just wanted to clarify that. I don't know, Morgan, are you going to bring me along down in Nevada? Um, well, of course. I, I think if I didn't bring you along, Ammon would get pretty mad at me. <laughs> We've been, are you are you hearing me very well? Yeah, I hear you just fine. Uh, but again, somebody's phone's vibrating. I don't know if you guys could just hear that. So, um, so Kelly, back to you. Uh, so, so in that, we've been a team for a long time, and we've been working on Ammon's team since the day before LeBoy Finnegan was killed. Actually, so um, we this is kind of a big fight. It's bigger than any one of these individual cases. So now, picking up there, what do you want to talk about first? Do you want to talk about this news about the Jury uh, verdict form, is that what you wanted to do first? Well, there's a whole lot of things that I want to talk about. However, tonight I think the main topic is this jury form. We would like to understand um, some of the behind the scenes that we do know is that last Thursday the jurors were called back or came back into before the judge with a question, and their question was uh, regarding con the conspiracy charge. Um, that then that question was sealed, so we really didn't understand what the full question was. And now we're seeing on this uh, jury for form that under the conspiracy count one and two, that they reported as a hung jury, um, that they had actually originally marked not guilty across the board, including Greg Burleson and Todd Ingle. Yeah. So, um, so what can you tell us about that? Yeah, so there's a lot of things. Uh, what's really interesting is, so after, you know, the jury comes into the courtroom and does the actual performance of delivering uh, delivering their verdict, and I, I, I don't mean to, pro to slight what they do, but you know, court is a live process. And then they reduce their decision formally to orders, etc., and that kind of thing, and there's what's called the court docket. And then the court enters official orders and filings and things like that on the docket. Well, what we noticed and what was brought to our attention by some, some basically trial observers and candid fans uh, who also are looking at the docket, um, yet, uh, let's see, on the 24th, it's a docket entry 1903, the court entered the official jury verdict form. And the official jury verdict form is signed by the jury foreperson, and it's the legal document that exists from the time of the verdict onward that legally attests to the result of the trial. And, and, you know, there are other records that get created that don't matter legally. Juror notes and things like that seldom, if ever, matter. Matter of fact, there's laws that say they can't matter. Um, there's the things that get said in the courtroom that sometimes matter. 
And one of the things we're actually trying to get a hold of and we still don't have is an actual recording of what happened during some of these discussions. Right now, uh, the transcript and those recordings are sealed. That's normal. Uh, but we need to get access to those, and I think we have access to those, but we haven't been able to review them since this news started to break. But somebody reviewing the jury verdict form noticed something rather unusual, and that is on the jury verdict form, they, they didn't, well, the two things. The first thing, count one and count two, which are the conspiracy charges, which is, you know, this is really the crux of the case. If you read the indictment, the conspiracy against the federal government is the thing that's kept these guys uh, in prison uh, all this time on pretrial detention and it's the the you know most egregious catch-all offense for lumping all these defendants together etc and there are seven or six different legal conclusions the jury was asked to make on each of these conspiracy counts and the jury verdict form reads as to count one of the superseding indictment charging conspiracy to commit an offense against the United States in violation of Title 18, United States Code, Section 371, we, the jury, and then it goes through and says, what do we find? Unanimously find, and then it has empty lines for potential check boxes or marks or initials, and under number one, assault on a federal officer, that's left blank. Under number two, Threatening a federal officer, a uh, law enforcement officer, that's left blank. Uh, number three, use and carry of a firearm in relationship to a crime of violence, that's left blank. Number four, obstruction of the due administration of justice, that's left blank. Number five, interference with interstate commerce by extortion, that's left blank. Number six, interstate travel and aid of extortion, that's left blank. So those were all the different things that the government spent two months putting on evidence trying to prove beyond a reasonable doubt that one, two, three, all of these defendants were guilty of conspiracy against the United States. And then there's a number seven option, and it says none of the above. If the jury chooses this answer, then the jury must find all defendants not guilty of count one. And there's a check mark in that area. Now, it's important to know that there are jury instructions that are official court records that are given by the court. They're debated about by the parties, argued about by the parties from before the trial, sometimes through the trial, all the way up until the very end. And the jury instructions tell the jury that what they put on this form has to be their official decision. This isn't like scratch paper. This isn't... Um, you know, like a working draft that you make changes to. If you make mistakes on the jury verdict form, you have to destroy it and get a new jury verdict form because it is the official court document. And what, what's even more interesting is down on the bottom of that same page, it says, for count one, we the jury unanimously find as to, and then it goes through all six of these first defendants, Greg Burleson, uh, Scott Drexler, Todd Engel, Ricky Loveland, uh, Eric Parker, and Stephen Stewart, and the not guilty line is checked on every single one of those, which means at some point in filling out this form, the jury was not hung. The jury had reached a unanimous verdict. They didn't change that. Now, there does appear to be, subsequently, lines, horizontal lines striking over those check marks. There's no indication what that means. Um, some people have surmised and said, well, that clearly means they were changing their mind. But that's not how this works. You change your mind, you get a new form. Um, some have suggested that maybe someone went in afterwards, the judge or the clerk went in afterwards and marked those. Highly unlikely. Anything's possible. We don't know. Um, but this is supposed to be the work of the jury. Matter of fact, if you go down to the very end of the document, you'll see this is the official document. It's signed on April 24th by the jury for a person. Of course, their name's whited out to protect their identity from harassment, but that's knowable. We know who that is. And this is officially docket number 1903. So this is the official jury verdict form. And it shows that the jury, at some point, was unanimously in agreement that all of the defendants were not guilty of count one. And then it gets even better because it goes to count two, um, 
on page three of the jury verdict form, and it does the exact same thing. There's a check mark in none of the above, and there's a check mark in the not guilty uh, area for every single defendant. And then again, there are these horizontal strike marks through those checks. It, it makes them look like X's, and it also looks like, if you look very carefully, there were some other marks that might be incomplete. We don't know what they are, but here's the other thing that's very interesting. There are no marks in the guilty section. So there's going to have to be some work done here to uh, investigate a little bit further what this represents, but it is obviously a big deal. This is an official verdict form, and it shows at the very least that at some point the jury foreperson signed a verdict form where there was unanimous agreement that all of the uh, defendants were found by the jury uh, beyond a reasonable doubt unanimously to be not guilty of both of these conspiracy charges. So again, there's still some questions, obviously. Um, we've got uh, some work going on behind the scenes, but even without all of our questions being answered, there are some serious uh, uh, legal questions uh, and legal issues uh, to be resolved. So uh, I don't know, is that what you wanted me to point out, Kelly? Is that what you were looking for? Yeah, for you know, the another thing is, um, it. let's see, is our screens, I don't think our screens are switching, so it's staying. Um, are you not, I, I, it looks like it switched. You, you're on oh, right there we now. go, now it switched. Yeah. Okay, um, so the other thing to point out is that when the jury came back on Thursday, that they were under the assumption that a not guilty verdict on the conspiracy meant that all other charges were not guilty as well. That was the instruction that the judge gave in the courtroom that other courtroom observers have reported. Um, actually last week, was that just last week? I had done a live stream of quoting um, Andrea Parker, who had also said that, that if they come back with a not guilty on the conspiracy, that it is not guilty on all other charges. And so what, what we're seeing here is that the jury heard the same thing that the courtroom observers heard and that Thursday before they, is, is the assumption, before they ended up taking the weekend off, um, that they were coming back into the courtroom believing that they were giving a not guilty, unanimous not guilty on all charges since the uh, counts one and two were being found not guilty, yeah. which that that's a... You know, that's an important thing to focus on that these jurors believed, um, just like the courtroom observers, what the judge said, which is if count one and two are, are not guilty, then they're, all the other charges are also not guilty. If there was no conspiracy yeah. to commit a crime let's, against the United States, then all other charges were not guilty as yeah. well. Let's, let's get clear on what probably happened. Now, you, you, you and I weren't in the courtroom. Uh, again, you know, Ammon, since I work on Ammon's defense team, we're preparing for this next trial. Uh, so I wasn't there. I know we've got good reports from people who are there, but let's talk about where that confusion likely comes from. So besides counts one and two, of course, there are several other counts on these other charges. Uh, for example, um, the you know uh, aiding uh, interstate commerce, aiding um, a threat of extortion, and the firearms charges, etc. And what happened is all those charges existed independently. In other words, the jury could have found any one of them guilty of those charges. But separately, those charges can also be predicates for these conspiracies, count one and two. In other words, the jury had to decide, for example, they found Todd Engel apparently guilty on two counts, one of which was the uh, interstate uh, commerce, uh, bringing a firearm in interstate commerce uh, as part of extortion. I, I, that's a horrible paraphrase, but, but you guys know what I'm talking about. So then the next question was, did he do that as part of a conspiracy? So there were two questions. And it looks like there was some confusion because the jury was ready to find that there was no conspiracy. or In fact, they did find at some point unanimously According to these documents, there's no doubt, there's no ambiguity. They did find at some point unanimously that no one did anything with regard to a conspiracy. And then that, that question probably created confusion because it, they were, like you say, going to find Todd Engel guilty of two counts and Greg Burleson guilty of several other counts. And they may have thought, oh, that invalidates our not guilty verdict, but it, it clearly doesn't. And, and so the question then is, 
and, and you know, the question you and I and, and Morgan and, and John aren't going to be answer, answer tonight is, well, what do you do about this? Because clearly the jury at some point reached a unanimous conclusion regarding the conspiracy counts. And I think that's what you were trying to allude to is the concerning part is, hey, wait a minute. If we had a not guilty verdict at some point, how does that get changed, right? Right. So uh, let me let me let me share something with uh, our our listeners. And John, uh, if you and Morgan want to chime in at any time, I don't want to be doing all the talking. But since I've got some resources here, I thought I'd share those first. Um, but but there are a couple important other issues that I think you know the people watching this might be interested to know. The other defendants may be interested to know. Their families may be interested to know. So. The judge, of course, entered a verdict of guilty on eight counts for Greg and two counts uh, for Todd, and it was declared a mistrial on the other counts. And, and what a mistrial means, or a hung jury means, it means that the, the judge found that the jury was undeniably hung, unable, basically, to come to an answer on these counts. Now we can talk about, there are even some questions about how that happened, but so the, so, you know, okay, now there's another hearing date. Now the, the you know, conversation for the last couple of days is, well, can these guys be retried? And I don't know if you remember on our broadcast yesterday, the question came up about double jeopardy, you know, so do these guys just get retried on the hung counts? Well, if you remember what I told you and what we were all talking about, the answer is yeah, double jeopardy hasn't attached. You know, and whenever you ask a legal question, whether it's to an attorney or a judge or anybody else, you need to know there's a whole series of asterisks that qualify any answer you ever give. Now that this information has come out about this jury verdict form, which has been formally entered in the case, there is a new double jeopardy question, separate and apart from the fact that it looks like the jury at some point may have reached the verdict of acquittal. I mean, there's going to have to be some investigation that maybe some of these defense attorneys are already aware what that uh, what happened to that jury verdict form but there's an issue I haven't heard anybody talking about and anybody watching this will be the first place I am aware of anybody's thinking about this let me share something with you in 2007 there was a really prominent case in the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals where uh, there was a situation where there was a discrepancy between the jury verdict form and the jury's verdict. And they ended up, and I, I'll, I'll save the facts of the case since it's not law school, but they ended up, there. this defendant ended up getting retried and convicted, and he challenged his conviction on double jeopardy grounds. And I want you to hear what the Ninth Circuit said in 2007. And they're citing a really famous Supreme Court case called Green. And here's what it says. The Supreme Court explained the doctrine of implied acquittal. When a jury convicts on a lesser alternate charge and fails to reach a verdict on the greater charge without announcing any splits or divisions and having had a full and fair opportunity to do so, the jury's silence on the second charge is an applied, implied acquittal. A verdict of implied acquittal is final and bars a subsequent prosecution for the same offense. Uh, there's another case uh, from the United States Supreme Court that they cited that goes clear back to 1898. Uh, this is, again, I, for some people maybe this is boring, but this is fascinating stuff. Here's, and this is a 2007 Ninth Circuit case. So this is the law that governs us in Nevada right now. This is binding legal authority, unless there are any signs of hopeless deadlock. And... Then, hey, hey, Rick. Yeah. Hold up a sec. I think you may have a feed interruption on Facebook. Okay. I don't think anybody's hearing you right now. Uh, it still says 364 people. All right. Maybe I'm off. All right. Go ahead. I, I, I'm not the only one saying it, though. There's a okay. few people posting this. Well, you know what happens when you start preaching the truth? You know what happens? You start preaching the truth, and the Facebook monitors and sensors inter interfere. All right, so we're good now. Denny says we're back. So where did I cut out? Well, here's the point. Here's the point. There's a legal doctrine that says a jury can acquit you. 
by a unanimous verdict that says not guilty. Um, and uh, sorry, I'm just I'm, I'm hesitant now. I want to make sure everybody's uh, still hearing me. Uh, Kelly, are you still there? Kelly, I don't hear you. Did you mute yourself? I did mute myself. My right. dog was drinking water. I'm sorry. Oh yeah, your dog needs to drink water. I just want to make sure that you know we're, <laughs> we're still here. We're back up to uh, 400 viewers, and we were up over 500. So uh, let's. Okay. John, are you still? This us? side is clear too. All right. Yeah, this side says it's clear too. So. All right. So so what these cases? What this Ninth Circuit case? It's called Brazel v. Washington. And for those of you who do legal research, you can find that at 491. F3rd 976. And uh, what it says is, separate from an actual acquittal, there are situations where a jury implies acquittal by their silence about deadlock. And here's what I mean. In this case, not only is there a question about whether or not the jury unanimously found at some point a not guilty verdict, there's no marks on the guilty side, and there's no indication in the record that has been filed that the jury was deadlocked on count one and two. Now, we've heard some reports in the media, and my, we've heard some comments from a couple of the defense lawyers that talked uh, to at least one of the jurors, and they gave us some votes. Remember the 10 to 2 and the 7 to 5 votes or whatnot on the conspiracy counts? But what's interesting is that's not reflected on this uh, jury form. So my guess is the reason there was a conversation after the fact with the judge and, and at least some of the jurors is because there is a question that just because they didn't find a not guilty expressly, there's still this question of a possible implied verdict here. Now, again, this is it would be premature to then take this and run with it and say that's absolutely the case. I'm just trying to say there's a legitimate legal question as to why we would want to know the answers here. And so what we've got to do is we've got to spend some time over the next day or two. We've got to talk with these criminal defense attorneys who were working on that first trial. We've got to get the recording and the transcript from the judge's conversation with the jury. And we've got to answer these two questions that really are there, at least two big questions. Number one, at some point, is it true that there was a unanimous not guilty verdict and that that's what this jury form reflects? And when did it become ununanimous? Was it before or after the Allen charge? Uh, because that would be a big deal. And then the second thing is, if the jury verdict form uh, is entered this way, does it give us legal grounds to argue that double jeopardy should preclude uh, Greg and Scott and Todd and Ricky and Eric and Stephen from being retried on the conspiracy counts? Now, of course, if you view things from the government's perspective and a prosecutor's perspective, your answer is going to be immediately, no, you guys quit being crazy, you know, quit, quit raising these issues. Um, but any fair person... <laughs> who sees a jury verdict form like this uh, would, would, would have questions. And any defense attorney worth an ounce of being a defense attorney would want to know, would, must know, the answers to those questions. So um, for, for when you and I were talking earlier, and I, I got some messages from other people, the point of my whole presentation here tonight is it is absolutely legi legitimate to have questions. It's absolutely normal and saying you don't have to be a conspiracy theorist you don't have to be you know up in the night there are some serious questions raised by just what is referenced on that jury verdict form so can i can i ask a question you said that if this changed after the allen charge um what would the significance of that be can you can you let us know what what why that would matter well because generally what what the reports are that we had is that the, ver the jury came back after the weekend and said that they had a certain agreement and certain disagreement. And at that point, there was a discussion in the courtroom. And if you read, I'm, I'm reading from the official summary by the court reporter. And here's what it says. Uh, this is uh, jury trial day 32 minutes. And uh, 
this is uh, basically Judge Nar Navarro's official accounting of what happened. But again, there's still going to be a recording and there's still going to be a transcript. But this is what has been entered as docket 1887. And here's what it says. The court, having received a note from the jury, convenes outside the presence of the jury. The court admonishes the parties regarding courtroom demeanor. The court and the parties discuss the jury note. The court hears argument regarding providing an Allen charge to the jury on deadlocked counts. See, it doesn't say there what counts were deadlocked. The defendants do not request providing an Allen charge. The government requests the court provide the jury with an Allen charge. So the government wanted an Allen charge, and the defense didn't request an Allen charge. And then it says the court will accept the unanimous verdict and provide an Allen charge on the remaining deadlocked verdicts. So the point is, if, if this verdict form had, was filled out and signed on these counts before that Allen charge was made then the court, by order, accepted that verdict. And when they went back into the jury room, if that's what happened and they crossed it out, there would be a question here, a very legitimate legal question, about whether that was permissible at all, legally. Um, the other issue is people might not know what an Allen charge is, but and we don't have time to go into all that, but an Allen charge generally is where the judge says, look, you can't give up. You need to go back and try harder. And... Um, the reason, another reason why it would be important is, is to whether this change happened before or after that Allen charge is the, the Allen charge isn't allowed to be used to undo verdicts. It's, it's, it's not legally tenable to, to have basically a, a judge say, you're wrong, go undo that. And so that's another reason why a, a, a good defense attorney would want to you know, look at this and say, Let's make sure we have answers to these questions. And now, some of these other defense attorneys, you know, they just went through a two-month trial. Somebody was complaining to me, how come we haven't heard from them? We, we've, we've been waiting several hours to get feedback from them. And I'm like, well, they just sat through two months of trial. They probably spent some time with family. Uh, so let's not, you know, the legal issues here aren't going to um, get resolved in a day or two anyway, even if everything were to be found completely in the defendant's favor here. Um you're, you're still, these guys are still going to be in jail. They're still going to be awaiting possible retrial. Um, it does make things a lot different and change the landscape, but let's not, let's not get mad at these attorneys for not, they may have some answers that would help us on this. But that's why, in answer, in, in answer to your question, Kelly, it would be very important to know whether those horizontal marks crossing out the check marks of a unanimous not guilty happened before or after the judge said, okay, we're accepting the unanimous verdict. 